The end future takes place in the near future after society and the econ economy has fallen, victims to the detriments of automation. These are very real issues that workers worldwide are combating today in 2019. Um, was this a strong inspiration for you while developing the series? Most definitely, yeah. It's When you look at what's happening technologically, like we are in many ways living in the future already. Right. And so the reality of what we're going to face as automation and AI really starts to hit the workforce, pretty, it's pretty scary. Like People really need to be thoughtful about yeah. what's about to happen over the next five to seven years. And so it just seemed like a very easy jumping off point for a cyberpunk book. Very relatable, something that they could uh invest themselves into because they're probably already most people is already suffering from it so I, I like that um, so Neon Future seems to take strong inspiration from the cyberpunk genre they really started to gain a following in 1982 with the release of Ridley Scott's Blade Runner which uh, also automate uh, uh, automation problems um, producing other creations like Robocop, Ghost in the Shell, The Matrix were existing films, anime and manga inspiration for you all uh, developing the series? Massively. And so, which ones in particular? Yeah, massively. So, um, things that really influenced me, so Blade Runner, Blade Runner 2049 are two of my favorite all-time films. Um, the Matrix, massively, massively an influence. Um, Ghost in the Shell, for sure, Akira, I mean, all of that stuff. It, if you're into the cyberpunk genre and you haven't, like, sort of got that deep into your marrow, um, you're missing some amazing things. So those are all things that I think the, the influences will be pretty subtle for fans of the genre. They'll see it echoed somewhat in the aesthetic. Um, the thing that I think people will most keenly feel because we deal in the real world and the digital world is the matrix. So people will feel a lot of that. Um, it's We handle it very differently, but they'll hear echoes for sure. Sure. I, I see, uh, from what I did see in the book, there's a lot of, a lot of blue in it and pink, which I, uh, which was obviously in 2049 a lot. There was a lot of beautiful blue and pink palettes, which I personally really like. So I'm looking forward to getting some time to read this myself. Um, can you go into the process behind creating the character uh, Kita? Uh, were you, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. Kita? Okay. Were you thinking of certain historical figures while building his character and personality? And uh, how would you define his relationship with Mars? Wow, what an amazing question. Uh, so yes, we were very much thinking of a real person and that's Nelson Mandela. So whenever you're dealing with something like this where it's a real divide between essentially races, so you've got in our book people who have technology embedded in their bodies and people who do not, and I think that's actually going to happen and I think it really is going to create the kind of almost race divide that we see in the book. And so whenever you're dealing with tales of oppression, um, there's so much to draw on. And Nelson Mandela to me is really fascinating because he said that there's three ways to deal with oppression. You can remain oppressed, you can become the oppressor, or you can find a third way to find harmony between the groups. And if you've ever read the book, Long Walk to Freedom, which is his autobiography, it is absolutely extraordinary. The guy went to prison for 27 years and people kept wanting him to advocate violence and he refused. And so the relationship between Kida and Mars is that debate. Like, at what point do you say enough is enough and we're going to do a violent uprising? And so Mars, who's also what we call augmented in the book, so you've got Kida and Mars both on the same side of the augmented, and they represent the peaceful way of trying to find what we call the third way of harmony, that's Kida, and then you have Mars who represents the violent overthrowing of the oppressors. And so it's the story ultimately asks the question, which of these two ways is right? And uh, it's, it's pretty fun to, to take that path because you've got a villain who has logic. Like when Mars right. says that we can't remain oppressed, we've got to push back, we've got to stand up for ourselves, he's not some maniacal evil genius. Like he's just tired of being kicked around right. and he's tired of seeing his friends die. And so, but at the same time, Kida has logic, which is if we just become the oppressors, we give up a piece of our humanity. And, you know, which is pretty interesting for somebody yeah. who's augmented to say. Right. And you know, aside from the Joker, the best villains are the ones who think they are the heroes. So yes. that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, so Clay Campbell is our central character and provides readers with insights and information on this amazing future world that you've built. What have been some of your key challenges in building and developing this character? And how do you hope readers will perceive it? So we wanted somebody who really starts about as far from where they're going to finish as a hero as possible. And so in the beginning, making sure that he was also likable 
um, was really something that we worked on so that you could relate to his struggles, you could relate to, this is a guy that's lost, and he really starts as, before our story opens, truly is a, a villainous character. He's somebody that's a big part of the oppression machine of the augmented class, and our story starts when he dies and is resurrected using the very technology he was trying to eradicate. And so you open with him having hatred for these people that are augmented, but now he's one of them, and so how does he deal with that? And making sure that he was likable so that people would want to go on the journey, that, that was uh, a needle that we had to thread. Uh, by chance, have you seen Altered Carbon? I have. Is that some sort of inspiration there, or that just that, coincidentally... That was inspiration on what not to do. So okay. I was so excited when I saw Altered Carbon yeah. announced. You can't imagine, I was beside myself. That, that novel, it, that's the, kind of the same thing you were going for, but you did, as far as create pr production-wise, you did it completely Yeah, different. I didn't read Altered Carbon, so I only okay. saw the show. Yeah. And when I saw the trailer, dude, I was so amped up because I'm yeah. a cyberpunk freak. Yeah. And I thought, oh my god, this is it, big budget cyberpunk, like I'm in. And then I watched it and they made the cardinal mistake in cyberpunk, which is to lose sight of your character because the world is so big. Yeah. And that was one thing we did not want to do. And so we worked with Eisner Award winning writer Jim Kruger. Mm -hmm. And he was just so extraordinary at making sure we never lost the characters for the big world. Um, yeah. And so looking at Altered Carbon, because I didn't read it, and I've heard that the book is, right. is significantly better. Oh, yeah. Um, it just, they were introducing characters so fast, and it just, uh, yeah. you don't there was feel a lot connected. Of, it felt like something that should have been done over three seasons. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Um, if, you, if you had looked at that series in that aspect, it's like, okay, it's a good story, but it was very rushed, especially in the last six episodes. It was like mm -hmm. dragged out, and then bam, all of it yeah. hit you. It was like they ran out of time, and they forgot what they were doing. So... I, li I like that you avoided that mistake. Um, so, did you provide colorists, uh, Abraham Lee's strict guidelines on the color palette to use, or was this an opportunity for complete creative freedom? So, Abe Lee is one of the most extraordinary artists working today. That guy is unreal. So, his ability to choose a color palette for a book, what he calls telling the color story, is is unbelievable so one of my favorite things in the world because he works in-house so literally he and i are okay. in an office together and seeing him for every issue pick the color story yeah. dude the the references that he pulls are in and of themselves some of the most gorgeous images you're ever going to see and then yeah. seeing him translate that into the book is amazing so yeah, yeah I, Every ounce of credit goes to Abe, and he has two other colorists that he's trained that are also in-house. Okay. Um, so, mad shout out to David and Nuo, who are both extraordinary colorists in their own right. Yeah, I mean, just the, the images to the left of us, you go from a strong blue and yellow right here, to a strong pink and black, and then to another pink and blue, it's, it's pretty, pretty extraordinary. Um, how did you ultimately decide on the finalized character design? So that was something that David Kim and I worked on together and um, is just that trial and error of, you know, doing a hundred variations and being like, nah, there's something wrong. It doesn't quite capture the character. Like there are a few things more iterative than concept art. And um, David and I often refer to the week that we did all the character design as our week in Paris. It was so much fun. And we were locked in a room, literally like, God, there were days we were probably there 18 hours a day. And just because we had a deadline, and if we didn't get it to the artist, we were going to miss our deadline for the first book. So we were just going nuts and just sitting together for so long. That guy is a workhorse. Just unbelievable. So young, so early in his career, and so talented. Oh, wow. Um, issue one ends with a foreboding warning of a coming war. Do you hope to influence readers which side to root for, or do you hope the readers will make their own opinions and sort of blur the lines between right and wrong, depending on their personal opinions? Yeah, I, I think that um, we want to, the, the most fascinating arguments are where you don't judge the other side, you really try to present it in, in all of its merits and all of its um, drawbacks. And I think that both sides, peace and violence, have merits and drawbacks. Right. Now. As a, a writer, I will say that ultimately there is one side that I believe in more than the other. Um, but we don't want to like make that. It's not going to be an easy choice, and it's not. People are going to see that it's not simple, and that you can't just choose one and think everything will work out fine. So um, I think readers will end up being a split camp on on who they think should be in control. 
So you're pretty much just challenging your own self and making your own self think, man, is this really the side I want? One thousand percent. And reading Long Walk to Freedom, you can't help but ask that question. Like, was he right? Was it yeah. worth the the price that he paid? I mean, it's it's pretty extraordinary. Um, so with cyberpunk and sci science fiction having become among the most popular genres in mainstream media today, what do you feel Neon Future does differently and what do you feel makes the series most unique? So certainly in the cyberpunk genre, I think the thing that we do better than anybody is remain focused on the characters. Um, that's a, a big thing. And then I think that people will find it super relatable. Because normally when people imagine cyberpunk, it's a world you can't recognize. It is so far removed. Like 2049, which is legitimately in my t probably top three films of all time, I'm beyond obsessed with that movie. But 2049 is sort of a ridiculous year to set that. Um, yeah. Maybe 2079, but probably even later than that. Just architecture. Think about zoning. It's like yeah. you could never change the look and feel of a city that rapidly. Um, so that's something I've always sort of had a beef with cyberpunk is is it, it just goes too far. It's too unrecognizable. Yeah. And given what's happening technologically today, you don't have to go that far. It doesn't have to be that extreme. So we're sort of that intermediary step. Like if you think of an altered carbon where it's a future you can't imagine seeing in your lifetime, Neon Future is a future you can imagine seeing right. in your lifetime. Yeah, like the um, the one scene, although it was a beautiful pan shot uh, in 2049 in the desert where all the monuments and stuff are completely just covered in sand. It's like, mm. how do you get a whole metropolis covered in sand? That's, that's you know, that's geological so right. in just 20 something years so it's like uh but that was it a little badass jarring, yeah but, but it was badass if they just pushed it a little bit farther out yeah. and made it you know 2079 or whatever yeah. or 2100 like anything like that just to to make it a little more realistic yeah. um what do you hope the overall message readers will take away when they read issues of well, the thing that I hope readers take away whenever they read it, literally anything that Impact Theory produces is that at the end you feel capable of more than you felt in the beginning. So that is that is our reason for existing. The reason the company's called Impact Theory is because my theory on how to impact people at scale is to give them a growth mindset via narrative. So it's gotta be story on the surface. Um, it, People need to be able to watch it and just be entertained and not even think about whether or not there's a message. But like films that I wish we had made, The Matrix is the perfect example. Star Wars, Karate Kid, Rocky, Rocky IV, like movies that just entertain the shit out of you. But at the same time, there really is something there. Like if you take yeah. Yoda's advice, your life will actually be better. Right. So it's trying to build that into the book. Right. Um, actually, that's all I have for you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful.